Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Shabbat. Are you enjoying the rain? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good to see all of you this morning. All those, especially who are visiting family of the Adventist Church, welcome once again. Especially Coral, is it? From China. Welcome once again. Also, I thought I saw Joseph. You already went back? Oh, okay. All right. Welcome back, Joseph, once again. Even though he's not here right now. And also, um, I see um, Pastor Hung Nong Wan and his wife, um, and his in-law, who is visiting from the States. As you know, Pastor Hung was the former Korean Union Conference president. He was the, literally the final boss of 1,000 Korean pastors in Korea. And uh, when he was the Union Conference president, I took my internship test. So I feel like I'm being tested again after more than 15 years. Thank you once again for coming, uh, Pastor Hong and his wife, and also uh, his in-law from the States. I think she's staying for about more than two weeks now, and then we'll return back to the States. So welcome once again. Feel right at home. Right, happy Sabbath once again. Thank you, um, Gloria, for the special music. Yeah. Right? Amen. Always um, with the piano. Um, the message was, let us return to God. His love never fails. Oh, amen. So thank you for your ministry, also the orchestra and the praise team and the audiovisual. Thank you for all your contribution and your dedication to make everything happen uh, as we serve the Lord together. Well, um, since last week, we have embarked on a series, a two-week short series, called Greatest Need. Greatest Need. Do you remember the title for last week's sermon? What was it? S-U-I-C's. Some new University International Church's Greatest Need. Wow, I'm surprised. Sometimes I even forget what I spoke last week. <laughs> But you remember even the title? S-U-I-C's greatest need was what? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. And there's a reason why I started the series last week. It was because I was reading through the Acts of the Apostles, and it was a plain message. I read it numerous times, and I know about it, but this time it struck me in a different way and capacity. Acts of the Apostles, page 50. It says, since this is the means by which we are to receive power, why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Why do we not talk of it, pray for it, and preach concerning it? The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve Him than parents are to give good gifts to their children. For the daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker should offer his petition to God. Why do we not hunger for the Holy Spirit and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Why do we not talk of it, pray for it, and preach about it? This became a great burden and struck me in a different capacity this time. The greatest need last week was your greatest need. Let's do a quick review, let's rewind a little bit for those who were not here last week and for those who forgot, just like I forgot, forget, forget sometimes. The Holy Spirit is the most urgent need in our lives. And so we talked about last week, to seek the Holy Spirit should be our first work. And we looked at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we took a look at the verb, we filled that tense. There was four of them. Do you remember? First was imperative, which means it's not a choice, it's not an option, it's not a friendly advice, but it is a command, a must, unavoidable command, imperative. 
be filled with the Holy Spirit. What was next? It was passive. We do not fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit, but God fills us with the Holy Spirit. Passive. Plural. It is not just for one person or a special group, but it is all for all those who ask in faith. And then it was the present imperative, which means it is not just a one-time thing in the past. It is not a one-time thing in the future. But it is a repetition, a constant. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, we looked at that, that the Holy Spirit was in a mission to transform our lives and to get us ready for heaven. The whole church in general. Other than the Holy Spirit, God uses many, many methods to reach to us. Through the Holy Spirit, what, what, what's there? What are some methods that God reaches us? and speaks to us and communicates to us through His Word, but of course the Bible. And we've talked about this, the Bible, B-I-B-L-E. What is it? That's the book for me, but that's the song. The B-I-B-L-E acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. God speaks to us. Basic instructions. I'm going to take you home, but these are just instructions till then. What else? Nature, of course. Rise of Elgin White. Through friends, through family members, through books. A lot. God uses every means to communicate with us. But, ultimately, it's between you and God. It's not your parents' faith. It's not your elders, head elders' faith. It's not the relationship of your pastor and God. But ultimately, it's between you and God. That's why the title for this morning is Your Greatest Need. Last week was our church's greatest need. This week, your and my greatest need. If you see this picture, what comes to your mind? Hmm? Family tree. Network, family tree. They're all connected, right? You know, connection, Facebook. You know, being connected or having this connection is very important, especially in Korea, right? Do you agree? We live in a total relationship based culture and society. Who you know is more important than what you know. If you know someone, things work out. I've heard some stories of being of having those connections. If you want to have a surgery in a major top five hospital in Korea, you try to go and try to book a reservation for surgery. If you don't know anyone there, how long does it take? A year? Maybe, maybe three, four months, I don't know. But a long time. But if you have some kind of connection in the hospital, how long? Sometimes immediately, sometimes in a week, two, three days. Connections. I remember when I was growing up, uh, my uncle, he had a business right next to the Jamshil baseball stadium. And a lot of baseball players would come to his business shop to enjoy and to eat some things. So he was very good friends with the baseball players. So whenever I wanted to go to a baseball game, I used my uncle's connection. <laughs> and without him buying a ticket, I would walk right through the VIP gate. Wow. No one would question me. <laughs> connection. Being connected. How about, how about things? Not just people, but how about things? What are we connected to? 21st century, if you go to the airport, you can see a lot of people waiting in line just to purchase what? Ticket? Something else. 
they are in line to purchase some kind of these little tiny things so they could be connected to the internet when they go abroad. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those little little things. You sins or push up or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> connected to Wi-Fi. 21st century is very important, especially for the younger generation. You can't live a second without being connected with Wi-Fi. You know, um, when I'm not speaking and I'm preaching, I stay in the back, usually try to greet and meet a lot of people and church members. The funny thing is, one of the most frequent questions that I get when I'm standing in the back is, do you have Wi-Fi? And number two is, what's the password? <laughs> Maybe I should have the password right here in my suit. <laughs> Wi-Fi. Honestly, I don't know the password, so please don't ask me. <laughs> Do you have Wi-Fi, and what's the password? Being connected is so important. When I was a freshman in theology, that was the first year that they made all the theology students stay in the dorm. First year. I live right next door, but I had to stay in the door. Three roommates in one room. And one of, one of our roommates, he had a girlfriend, and he would talk on the phone late at night. So we would kick him out. Hey, we got to go to bed. Come on, go out and talk. So we would always kick him out, and he would go outside and talk and come back. But this one day, he went out, we kicked him out again, he went out to talk, and he thought we were sleeping. We had our lights off, I was lying down, but I couldn't get to sleep, but quietly, he snuck in, back to the room. And I was wondering, what is he doing? It was dark, but I could just sense and feel that he was connecting his phone to the charger. And then, he didn't go to sleep. He continued talking on the phone. He ran out of batteries, of course. So he had to come in. He was not connected with the source. He came back to the room without knowing that I was awake. He connected to the charger and continued to talk to his girlfriend. And I had the privilege of listening to the love talk. I was awake that night. He was able to talk for a long time, if he wanted to all night maybe, because he was connected to the source. Connection. And it's same with our spiritual journey also. Notice in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, a person, a Christian, a believer that is connected with God. It says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, connected to the source, the water, which spreads out its roots by the river. And notice what happens when you're connected to the source. Will not fear when he comes. Even though you are connected to the source, he comes. Difficult situations come. Will not fear. But his leaf will be green. And will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Connection to the source. Testimonies from the church of all made, it is, listen carefully here, it is the absence of the Spirit that makes the gospel ministry so what? Powerless. It strikes me right here. It is the absence of the Spirit that makes the gospel ministry so powerless. Learning, talent, eloquence, Every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed. But without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched. No sinner one to Christ. On the other hand, if they are connected with Christ, if the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, the poorest and most ignorant of his disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them channels for the outflowing of the highest influence in the universe. Amen? Amen.
It is the absence of the Spirit of God that makes the gospel ministry so powerless. Not just ministry, our spiritual daily lives. If you, if you think your faith is withering, the absence of the Holy Spirit. If you think, oh, this doesn't make any sense. Faith is meaningless anymore. Absence of the Holy Spirit. It makes us so powerless. Connection. Connected to the source of life, Jesus Christ. Connected to the Word of God. And connected to the Holy Spirit. This brings us to the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. This is a question by Paul to some of the church members in the church of Ephesus. They're called disciples, about 12 of them in the church of Ephesus. Paul, asking this question, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Straightforward question. What if someone asked you this question today? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? But this is their answer. Notice here. They said to them, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. This question is heard loud and clear 2,000 years later, even today, in our hearts. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, you might be wondering, Pastor Ryan, stop right there. Stop right, hit the pause button right there. What's the point? Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Can't I just come to church, enjoy lunch, go back home, pray sometimes, read the Bible? Simple enough. Why do I need the Holy Spirit, Pastor? That could be a question. And in order to take a look and answer that question together, we need to study the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's many, but I brought three major roles of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit guides you into the truth. What is it, everyone? Guides you into what? The Holy Spirit is the guide that guides us when we are lost into the truth. John 16, 13 says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. It is the role of the Holy Spirit for all the Bible students, all the believers, to guide them to the truth. John 14, 26, By the help of the Holy Spirit, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The Holy Spirit is the guide and a teacher of the truth. Without the Holy Spirit, we can read the Bible. No matter how intelligent and smart you are, you can read the Bible and try to understand it. But without the Holy Spirit's guidance and teachings, you will get to experience just a tiny little bit on the surface of the treasures that is in the Bible. It is like when you're eating a fruit. You know, I love strawberries and blueberries. Those are two of my favorite fruits. And growing up in Barron Springs, Michigan, every season I would go and you know, pick blueberries and strawberries. You know, picking, you have to pay for it, but eating there is free. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't waste my time picking and bringing it home. That was my parents' job. My job was to eat as much as I could. And we would pick a lot, and we would have a separate freezer that would only have this in, in these Ziplocs. Blueberries and strawberries, frozen. Hundreds of these bags inside the freezer. Every day was my routine to come back home from school, and I would have that, my precious time of eating 
that whole bag of frozen strawberries or blueberries. And anyone that came to my house during that time, they would be shocked because when I opened the door, the color of my mouth would be either dark blue or red. So delicious, those fruits. But what if my parents told me you could only have that tiny little seed of the strawberry today? How would I feel? I would feel I'm missing out a lot if I'm just having that tiny little seed on top of the strawberry. This is... This is... My testing. My testing. My testing. So then can you ask him to turn on the microphone? Come back. All right. This is connected to the source. This is not wireless. <laughs> this is the whole point of today. You need to be connected. This is wireless, and if it runs out of batteries, it doesn't work. So I'll continue. What happened to the source? All right, we're connected again. That's the same analogy, logic. Without the Holy Spirit, you can read the Bible, you can study the Bible all you want, but you can get just a tiny little bit of that seed of the strawberry. The Holy Spirit is the guide and the teacher to the truth. Number one, the role of the Holy Spirit guides you into the truth. Number two, the Holy Spirit helps us understand sin, understand righteousness and judgment. John 16, 8, it says, When He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. In a conviction of sin, appreciation and understanding of righteousness, And awareness of judgment are all brought by the Holy Spirit. Step to Christ 64 65 says, Sister White writes, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your eyes. For your vision will be clear, and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. That the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. The influence of the Holy Spirit and helps us understand sin. Helps us understand and feel that the need of Christ because of our sin. Righteousness following the example of Jesus Christ and judgment. Awareness of the judgment. That vivifying influence of the Spirit of God. Rule number three. The Holy Spirit testifies in Jesus Christ. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will, what? Testify of me. The Holy Spirit speaks of Jesus and brings His presence into our lives. The Holy Spirit leads us to Christ. Amen. Role of the Holy Spirit, number one, He is a guide to the truth, teacher of the truth. Number two, He helps us understand sin, righteousness, and judgment. And number three, He testifies the Holy Spirit testifies, leads us, and shows us 
Jesus Christ. In other words, the question, why do I need the Holy Spirit? If you rephrase that, you could say, why do I need Jesus in my life? It's the same thing as I'm not interested in knowing the truth. I'm not interested in studying the scriptures, the word of God. I don't need to repent. There is no judgment. And ultimately it's admitting that you don't need Jesus in your life. It leads to that ultimately. Without Jesus, there is no true repentance. Without Jesus Christ, there is no true righteousness. Without Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. The Holy Spirit in our lives. Is it important? Is it important? The Holy Spirit in our lives. Imperative. Passive. Plur and present imperative tense. You know, the Holy Spirit is not some kind of magical force or some kind of power. It's a member of the Godhead, the Trinity. Some people think the Holy Spirit is some kind of a magical genie that you take out when you're in trouble. Gospel Romans 285 says, we don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses us. Amen. Is that true? true? We don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not some kind of a force or a power. But the Holy Spirit uses us. Sister White continues here. Without Him we are powerless, but with Him in control, all power is given Amen. to us. So how do we receive the Holy Spirit? Galatians 3, 14, that we might receive the what? Promise. Promise the promise Promise. of the Spirit Faith. with Faith. Faith. God is faithful in keeping His promises, and He promised the Holy Spirit. And it says that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, if you know how, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Holy Spirit, we ask with faith, and God is ready to keep His promise, to give the Holy Spirit, to pour down His Holy Spirit upon us. Testimony for the Church, Volume 1. God is willing to work for us, to give us His free Spirit, if we will strive for it, live for it, believe for it, and then we can walk in the light as He is in the light. We can feast upon His love and drink in of His rich fullness. You know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we cannot mention, we cannot help but mention Galatians chapter 5. What is in Galatians chapter 5, everyone? Fruits of the Spirit. Before that, the work of the flesh. I didn't prepare a slide because I want, it's so precious, I want you to open your Bibles, to take out your phones and open your Bibles, take out your Bibles. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. For those who are watching online, please open together to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes about a struggle here. The work of the flesh and the work of the spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Here's a question for you this morning. How many of you have struggles in your life, in your hearts, between good and evil. All the time, right? We say great controversy, great controversy, but 
Great controversy starts right here in our hearts. Paul writes this, he experienced it, the work of the flesh, the work of the spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he says what? I die daily. I die daily. Let me introduce to you one other text that Paul wrote about the struggles that he had. Romans. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans. Chapter 7. Chapter 7, chapter 8, probably one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible that you can find. Romans chapter 7 and also chapter 8, but let's look at chapter 7 first. Chapter 7 verses, let's start with 17. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. The struggle that Paul had before me in Christ and after me in Christ. Some scholars say this is before, but most of the scholars are in the consensus that this is after, even after Paul's conversion. Still had this great controversy. The struggle of good and bad, of flesh and spirit inside his heart. Chapter 7, he writes about these struggles, about sin. But chapter 8, the most beautiful chapter you can find, probably. Free from the indwelling sin. With the help of the Holy Spirit, let's look at chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And through this help and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, notice the beautiful testimony of Paul. We all know these verses, Romans Chapter 8, the whole book of, the chapter of Romans 8, but Romans chapter 8, verse 35. With the Holy Spirit's help and guidance and truth, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Chapter 39, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The struggle inside, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The testament of Paul, he says, what can separate me from the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ? We are more than conquerors, and nothing can separate us from Jesus Christ. We go on, we go back to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22, just like Kim said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you take a look at this, this is the life of Jesus Christ, amen? amen. Jesus lived the life of the fruit of the Spirit. And how are we to bear fruits? We know this verse, John 15, 5. I am the vine, your branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Let's read it together. For without me, you can do nothing. Without being connected to the vine, connected to the source of life, you can do nothing. 
This is on pages 676. Sister Wright writes, Abiding in Christ means, what? A constant receiving of His Spirit. A life of unreserved surrender to His service. The channel of communication must be open once, just one day, continually. Imperative present, continually between man and his God. As the vine branch constantly draws the sap from the living vine, so are we to cling to Jesus and receive from him by faith the strength and perfection of his own character. We go on, Galatians chapter 5, after the, the fruit of the Spirit, verses 24 and 25, listen carefully here. Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 and 25, the life of a Christian that bears the fruit of the Spirit. And those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. Conclusion of the fruits of the Spirit. Let us walk, live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. The greatest gift, the greatest need, the Holy Spirit. You know, King David knew this truth, that the greatest need for his life was the Holy Spirit. So notice, after his great sin, after he was, when he was during the darkest times of his life, when he was at the bottom of the pit, what was his confession? Psalms 51. Create in me a clean heart. And then it goes on. It says, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The greatest gift, the greatest need, they knew the Holy Spirit. You know, some of you might be in a situation like David, the lowest part of the darkest times of your life, the darkest tunnel of your life. But let us remember that if we are connected to the source, when the source, when the Holy Spirit takes possession of our heart, no matter what situation we are in, no matter how down and under we may be in, God will transform our life. Amen. That's His promise and His will. Amen. To provide the Holy Spirit for our sake and for His sake to transform our lives. Last quotation this morning, Desire Reads 173. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. It transforms not just your Sabbath. It transforms not just your Monday, or at work, or at home, or at school. It transforms your whole life. Simple thoughts are put away, evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. Friends, this morning, May this be our prayer. May this be our prayer. At this time, I would like to ask all of us, just like last week, to spend some time in prayer with God. Just a short time, but this is your chance. If you have something in your heart, something in your mind, in your life, that keeps you from total surrender to the Holy Spirit and to God, this is your time to communicate and to talk with God, to give up that something and to fully surrender to God. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit, the greatest need of our life. Let us ask for the abundant blessings and the pouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. For about three, four minutes, why don't we kneel if you can and pray silently by yourself. So the piano finishes.